this um, meeting is now come to order. And the committee is meeting today to receive testimony on H.R. 6504, the Native Pacific Islanders of America Equity Act. This legislation would establish a Native Chamorro registry program under the Office of the Governor of Guam, as well as include Native Chamorro organizations and Na Native Northern Marianas organizations as disadvantaged groups under small business administration programs like the HA and the HOPS so out zone programs. Under Committee Rule 4F, any op or opening statements of hearings are limited to the chair and the ranking or the member or their designees. This will allow us to hear from our witnesses sooner and help members keep to their schedules. However, in this case, we will allow the sponsor of the legislation to make an opening statement as well. I therefore ask unanimous consent that all other members' opening statements be made part of the hearing record if they are submitted to the clerk by 5 p.m. today or the close of the hearing, whichever comes first. Hearing no objection, so ordered. Without objection, the chair will may also declare a recess subject to the call of the chair. As described in the hearing notice, statements, documents, or motions must be submitted to the electronic repository at hnrcdocs at mail.hous.gov, hnrcdocs at mail.house.gov. Additionally, please note that as in-person meetings, members are responsible for their own microphones. As with our in-person meetings, members can be muted by staff only to avoid inadvertent background noise. Finally, members or witnesses experiencing technical difficulties should inform committee staff immediately. Uh, stay, uh, on, stay on the, the platform, uh, mute yourself and contact committee staff immediately. Uh, good afternoon and good morning to those of us in the Northern Marianas and Guam, where it is now seven o'clock uh, in the morning. And thank you to all our witnesses for participating in today's legislative hearing. A welcome to our all witnesses, to all our witnesses today. I want to especially welcome good friends, Governor Guerrero of Guam and Speaker Terlahi of the Guam Legislature. We're meeting today to receive testimony from elected officials from Guam and other relevant parties on H.R. 6504, School the Native there. Pacific yeah. Islanders of America Equity Act. This bill would expand business opportunities for our indigenous entrepreneurs to allow tomorrow and the follow us own firms to participate in federal contracting and mentorship programs open to other Native peoples in America. H.R. 6544 would establish a means to identify qualified Native Chamorro companies in Guam and organizations owned by individuals of Northern Marana's descent as firms eligible for small business, business administration benefits, including preference for federal set aside, sole source and general contracts. H.R. 6504 was introduced by my friend and colleague from Guam, Congressman Mike San Nicolas. I joined as an original co-sponsor and I thank the Congressman for working with me generously to include Chamorro under follow us entities from my district, the Northern Mariana Islands as eligible for the bill's expanded SBA benefits. Currently, other Native groups and organizations get preferential, preferential consideration through the 8A program of the US SBA, while the Indigenous and Chamorro and Refalawas do not. The 8A program provides training and certification of American Native Alaska and Native Hawaiian enterprises for set aside and sole source federal contracts. The 8A program has been shown effective in providing meaningful assistance to socially and economically challenged groups throughout our country. Enactment of H.R. 6504 would bring indigenous Chamorro and Refalawas organizations effectively compete for federal contracts in the region. This will be especially important for firms that will compete for projects related to the buildup of U.S. forces in our region. The new opportunities created by the bill should help strengthen and diversify our economies. We had hoped to have the director of the Northern Marianas Small Business Development Center as a witness to testify on the bill today. Unfortunately, he was not able to join us. I want to again welcome all of our witnesses. I look forward to hearing your test, receiving your testimony. Now, let me yield to Congressman Cliff Benz for his opening statements. Mr. Benz, please. Thank you, Vice Chairman Saban, and uh, thank you to the witnesses for joining us today. Uh, the purpose of today's hearing is to hear testimony regarding H.R. 
6504, the Native Pacific Islanders of America Equity Act. The Chamorro people are the native people of Guam and the Northern Marianas Islands. The history of the Chamorro dates back 3,000 to 3,500 years when seafaring peoples migrated from Southeast Asia and settled in the Northern Marianas. During World War II, many Chamorros were forced into helping Japanese forces during the Guam and Northern Marianas occupations. In short, the bill before us today, H.R. 6504, does three things for the native Chamorro people in Guam and the Northern Marianas. First, it would amend the Guam Organic Act to establish a Chamorro registry program under the office of the governor. A person who submits a request to the office must be able to provide evidence that documents that they or a direct ancestor were residing in Guam on or before August 1st, 1950. Additionally, the Guam Office of Public Auditor is required to ensure the accuracy of the database every three years. The bill would amend the Small Business Act to define the term Native Chamorro organizations in Guam and the Northern Marianas and make them eligible for the 8A program. Codifying these organizations in statute removes a rebuttable presumption that a Chamorro organization or individual is socially and economically disadvantaged. The 8A program provides a participating socially or economically disadvantaged small business with technical assistance, training, and government contract opportunities through set-aside and sole source awards. Lastly, the bill would amend the Small Business Act to include Native Chamorro organizations in Guam and the Northern Marianas as small business concern as a small business concern for the purposes of the SBA Hub Zone program. Participating small businesses are located in areas with low income, high poverty, or high levels of unemployment with contracting opportunities in the form of set-asides, sole source awards, and price evaluation preferences. Currently, there are six hub zone types. According to the SBA hub zone map, both Guam and the Northern Marianas are currently qualified as non-metropolitan counties. While Congress has amended the Small Business Act to statutorily add specific small business concerns as socially and economically disadvantaged, I believe it's unfortunate the Small Business Administration is not part of today's panel. I would like to work with you to receive views from that agency. Lastly, I believe we must work in close collaboration with our colleagues in the Small Business Committee, which has primary jurisdiction over these two SBA programs to ensure the adequate processes for implementation are in place before the bill proceeds through the legislative process. With that, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, thank you and I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Benz. Um, and uh, let me know, uh, the Chair will now recognize the sponsor of HR 6504, Mr. San Nicolas, uh, for five minutes, Mike. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and greetings to our witnesses present here today. I wish to specifically recognize our Governor of Guam, the Honorable Lu Leung Guerrero, our Speaker of the Guam Legislature, the Honorable Therese Terlahi, and Mr. Rob Salas, representing our local business community. Before proceeding, Mr. Chairman, I would like, without objections, to place into the record of today's hearing correspondence from the Guam Chamber of Commerce endorsing H.R. 6504, and from the Republican Party of Guam also endorsing H.R. 6504, the legislation we have convened this hearing for today. Without objections, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to recognize Ms. Kathy Castro, President of the Guam Chamber, and Mr. Juan Carlos Benitez, Chairman of the Guam Republican Party, for their leadership in securing these endorsements of the legislation. Mr. Chairman, today is indeed an auspicious day. Not only for the fact that we have the leaders of both our senior elected offices on Guam testifying before us, and not only because we have firm consensus in both the public and private sectors of Guam, as well as our political parties of Guam supporting today's efforts, but more specifically because today we are coming face to face with over 3,500 years of history and over 500 years of colonialism that comprise the history of the, of the native people of Guam, the Chamorro people. Guam is not just a territory of the United States. It is the home of the Chamorro people who are indigenous to Guam and are her native inhabitants. I, along with the witnesses testifying today, all identify as Chamorro, those of us from Guam, and our lineage is historically traced to prehistoric migration from the Austronesian region over 3,500 years ago. Native Chamorros settled on Guam. Though the thriving seafaring society traded with our neighbors throughout the region and always regarded Guam as home. In 1521, a desperate Spanish expedition arrived on Guam's shores, claimed the island for Spain, and touched off what would be over 100 years of resistance that our history regards as the Chamorro-Spanish Wars. 
after decimation by disease and conflict, the Chamorro were forcibly subjugated on their home island of Guam, but at no time did we ever relinquish our home, our culture, or our identity. In 1898, the United States acquired Guam as a spoil of war after defeating Spain in the Spanish-American War, acquiring the island and inheriting the indigenous Chamorro, who through our own initiative sought and ultimately attained citizenship in the United States with the passage of the Organic Act of 1915 signed into law by President Harry S. Truman. Mr. Chairman, H.R. 6504 seeks to create a process for we indigenous Chamorros of Guam to be so identified in this federal government by allowing us to be recognized as native for those of us who can trace our ancestry back to the pre-citizenship period before 1950. The native recognition we seek in this legislation is not intended to disrupt or encroach on any existing native resources that we on this committee know all too well are insufficient for our brothers and sisters in our native communities. Rather, we simply seek through the passive of HR 6504 to be able to be recognized as native for the purposes of being able to avail of the existing 8A program of the Small Business Administration that was created for native people to be so recognized when doing business with this federal government, as well as other disadvantaged groups to be able to be so recognized. Passage of HR 6504, as we will hear from our witnesses today, will enable native Chamorros, American citizens, to be rightfully included in the way all native people should be when doing business with the federal government. The existence of the native Chamorro is irrefutable, and our place among our native brothers and sisters in this country, and in particular in the 8A program administered by the SBA, is justice in capitalism personified. I humbly ask for the subcommittee's support of the passage of HR 6504 for this noble purpose, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. San Nicolas. Um, and so, um, and now I will introduce uh, the witnesses uh, by name. Uh, we have first the Honorable Lu Leon Guerrero, the Governor of Guam. Welcome, Governor. Uh, we have the Honorable Therese M. Terlahi, Speaker of the Trent Isais Legislatura in Guam. Welcome, uh, Madam Speaker. Mr. Robert Salas, the second president of Pacific Federal Management Incorporated. And Mr. Joshua B. Duval, shareholder with Maynard Cooper and Gale, PC. And Mr. Matthew Skuno is Conover, managing member with Skunover and Moriarty, LLC. Let me do, remind the witnesses that under committee rules, they must limit their oral statements to five minutes, but that their entire statement will appear, will appear the hearing record. When you begin, uh, the timer will begin and it will turn orange when you have one minute remaining. I recommend that members of witnesses joining remotely use grid view so that they may be in the timer on their screen. After your testimony is complete, please remember to mute yourself to avoid any inadvertent background noise. I will allow the entire panel to testify before questioning continues. And so uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Governor Leon, Lou Leon Guerrero. Um, Governor, you have, you may present your uh, oral remarks, please. Welcome. Half a day, Chairman Kilili Sablan, Congress, Congressman uh, Mike Sinicholas, and other members of this committee. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony in support of HR 6504 to identify Native Chamorro organizations as an eligible disadvantaged group for federal contracting under the Small Business Administration. Guam's population has significantly declined over the last 10 years. Results from the 2020 census reflect an overall 3.5 decrease in the number of local residents. With the disruption to our lucrative tourism industry caused by COVID-19 pandemic, we look forward to the new business opportunities that this legislation would provide for native Chamorro organizations. Our decline in population and significant loss in tourism arrivals, in addition to the inequity under federal programs, will adversely affect our ability to generate sustaining economic growth if additional opportunities are not created, especially at this pivotal time for economic recovery. 
Many businesses in Guam continue to experience economic loss and hardship stemming from the pandemic. SBA programs such as the Restaurant uh, Revitalization Fund, Economic Injury D Disaster Loan, and regular 7A loan program guarantees have been vital in providing necessary economic aid. However, we have noticed the inequitable treatment our people have received within these programs. For example, of the 297 Guam businesses that applied for funding through the RRF, only about 27% qualified and received RRF funds. Unlike our state counterparts who have diverse markets to supplement their economies, our food establishments are a large segment of our island's tourism industry, Guam's primary industry. Guam is in a unique situation because our recovery is tied to international travel, which continues to be negatively impacted by this COVID-19 pandemic. Other programs, including the Targeted Economic Injury Disaster Loan and Supplemental Targeted Advance, left many of Guam's businesses without the assistance they need. In order for low-income communities to avail themselves of this program, they needed to be located within low-income areas, as identified in the SBA's mapping tool, which used the last census data. For Guam, the SBA's mapping tool did not identify our low-income communities, despite the U.S. Department of Agriculture's recognition of Guam's island-wide school district as a high-poverty zone in 2018. For the purpose of most federal grant applications, the entire U.S. territory of Guam is considered an underserved and disadvantaged population. This inconsistency has caused many of our business owners to be declared ineligible for funding. My administration is prepared to carry out the provisions of this bill requiring the establishment of a genealogy database under the office of the governor of Guam to identify individuals as native Chamorros. Gaining federal recognition is most essential to extend federal contracting opportunities afforded by the SBA to native Chamorro small businesses, including the 8A Business Development Program. In fiscal year 2020, 8A firms were awarded $34 billion in contracts, including $9.3 billion in 8A set-aside awards and $11.1 billion in 8A sole source awards. Such funding is critical for our small businesses to obtain the training and supplies needed to maintain our operations given the nation's rise in the cost of goods and to bolster the island's rate of employment. To effectively implement this legislation, we request that an appropriation be included in the bill to adequately provide for the necessary resources that will be required to establish and maintain a native Chamorro registry. Given the shortfalls caused by COVID-19 pandemic, we must ensure that our government will have the means to carry out the bill's provisions effectively. Additionally, we request that an amendment be added to require rules and regulations on how my office will work with SBA to provide information necessary for the determination of whether an organization is a native tomorrow organization. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for this opportunity. And with these recommended changes, this legislation will provide greater parity for our people and allow our businesses to flourish at the same level as other federally recognized organizations. Lastly, we would like to recognize Delegate Sir Nicholas for this initiative, and we thank the committee for acknowledging the importance of this measure and for giving us the opportunity to have our voices heard. Thank you, and Sizu Asmasi. Thank you, Governor Guerrero. And so um, I'd now like to recognize our other elected official from Guam, uh, Speaker Terlahi. Please, uh, you may start your oral remarks. Papa Day, and our warmest greetings from Guam to the Honorable Chairman Grijalva and, and the Acting Honorable Vice Chairman, or the Honor Acting Chairman Sablan. 
our uh, to the honorable ranking member congressman Benz and to all members of the committee I'm speaking for Terry Strahi of the 36th Guam Legislature, which is a unicameral body, 15 senators representing a population of about 153,000. I introduced Guam Legislature Resolution Number 260, which expresses the support of the Guam Legislature for HR 6504. We expect to vote on this resolu resolution later today during our first day of session and, and we'll transmit it to your committee immediately. Native Chamorros, as has been said, has a 3,500 to 4,000 year history in Guam and the Marianas. Following a 300 year occupation by the Spanish and the Treaty of Paris in 1898, the Chamorros on Guam lived under US naval rule, followed by civilian governors appointed by the President of the United States. The Native Chamorros suffered a brutal three year occupation by the Japanese during World War II. Land takings by the United States government of almost all of Guam and wherein the U U.S. Department of Defense now still occupies and controls one third of our island. In 1950, the U.S. Congress enacted the Organic Act for Guam and conveyed U.S. citizenship. And only in 1970 was Guam allowed to elect its first governor. But despite our people's resilience, the Chamorros continued to suffer from the highest incidences of poverty, diabetes and cancer mortality. Using 2010 census data, 22.5% of all individuals on Guam for whom poverty status was determined were considered to be in poverty. And based on our population data from the 2020 census, 30% of our population was enrolled in Medicaid, and 34% of the population qualified for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP. We expect that these numbers are higher now. My colleagues and I are in support of HR 6504 because it will bring equity in certain federal contracting preferences and training opportunities to Native Chamorros and to the Native Chamorro nonprofit organizations that will be established pursuant to this bill to assist the government in addressing economic and health disparities suffered by Native Chamorros. The success of the current Section 8A programs and the Hub Zone programs is evident in helping meet critical needs for Native Hawaiians, Alaska Natives, and the Native Americans. Again, equity for Native Chamorros will serve a similar purpose. The definition of Native Chamorros in this bill is tied to 1950. It does not describe the Native inhabitants of Guam prior to the 1521 contact with outsiders or prior to the 300 year occupation by the Spanish, prior to the Treaty of Paris or prior to the US Naval rule or prior to World War II occupation or prior to the 1950 conveyance by the United States Congress of Citizenship to the residents of Guam. But I believe for purposes of this particular small business program that this definition will adequately address the disparity and significantly help to remedy the needs of Native Chamorro businesses and community on Guam, as was the goal of the Section 8A programs. In 2007, Chamorro owned businesses comprise only 0.01% of all the businesses in the United States. And currently, there are only seven companies located on Guam that avail of the Section 8A program as a minor minority owned business. 90% of all businesses on Guam are small or micro businesses and report less than 500,000 in annual, annual revenue. Passage of this bill would create incentives for businesses to apply for the 8A program because as super 8A businesses, they would continue in the program longer than the nine year limit and they would benefit tremendously from technical assistance and expertise provided by the Small Business Administration. HR 6504 would boost Guam's 8A portfolio numbers and thus provide a stronger platform of federal contract opportunities for native Chamorro firms. Parity for Native Chamorros and federal contracting preferences and community benefits associated with the Native Chamorro nonprofit organizations is long overdue and necessary to assist socially disadvantaged and economically disadvantaged groups as recognized in congressional findings in the establishment of the Section 8A and Hub Zone programs. And we humbly ask for the committee's support on HR 6504 and hope to see its passage. We thank you for your opportunity to speak on this important measure, and I'm happy to provide any additional information that requested by the committee. Sidzu Osmasi, and thank you. Thank you. Wow, both um, elected officials came in within five minutes. Well, I, would have, I would not have gobbled your time, but thank you for doing that. Uh, and so um, let me uh, recognize at this time, uh, Mr. Salas, uh, Mr. Salas, uh, please, uh, your five minutes for your oral remarks. So we'll hop a day to my uh, vice, to the vice chairman Saban and our congressman Mike Sinicholas. I do want to thank, uh, thank Chairman Riava 
and all the distinguished members of the Natural Resources Subcommittee for allowing me to testify here today on behalf of Bill H.R. 6504, the Native Pacific Islanders of America Equity Act. I believe that if passed, this bill represents a huge step in creating equity and justice for the Native Chamorro people of Guam and the Northern Marianas Islands. This bill is very similar to bills that already exist for the Native brothers and sisters of Hawaii and Alaska, which allows them to create organizations to participate in the SBA 8 Business Development Program. And I believe that this bill comes at the most opportune time. There's already a build up occurring here in the Pacific region. So in Guam alone, we have 5,000 troops transiting from Okinawa to Camp Blas, with many other bases being built in the area. So it'd be a great opportunity for the native organizations of Guam to grow from the development that's occurring within their own backyards. So I myself, I'm a native terminal business owner. I was born and raised on the island of Guam, and I've been in the Pacific, uh, and I've been in the federal contracting business for about eight years. So I'm extremely invested in the local community and the buildup as a whole. And I strongly believe that in Guam and the Marianas, we have the talent, we have the passion, and we have the entrepreneurial spirit to benefit from this program. And I'll give a few reasons why. So in 2021, three of the top 200 performers from the Associated Builders and Contractors um, Association were actually headquartered in Guam. And in 2022, we have another four businesses headquartered in Guam that qualify as accredited quality contractors. So what, what exactly does this mean? Well, to qualify for this list, the companies must not just dem demonstrate financial soundness, high quality of work. Um, they must have the highest standards of safety. They have, to, they have to invest in their workforce and talent. They have to have a culture of inclusion and diversity. They have to contribute to the community as a whole. These businesses must be the complete package. So an interesting fact is that of the four businesses that made it in Guam, three of them are either in or graduating from the SBA development program. So what that tells me is that this program really works. So right now, as looking through the um, SBA website, we have about 10 firms that are registered. Four of them are Alaska Native and Native Hawaiians. We have over 500 small businesses that are registered. So we have the pool of talent here in Guam. There's the opportunity for, for us to get additional um, participants in this program. And in fact, I believe Mark Spain, the district director of the Hawaii SBA office, already set a target to get to 30 if this bill were to pass. So imagine the impact it could create for the Native Chamorro people of Guam if this were to happen. It would help the Native Chamorro people develop and grow, but on the other hand, it also helped the U.S. government by creating a better marketplace for competition. This would truly be a win-win. I believe that if this bill were to pass, the Native Chamorro people would naturally invest in the talent and the workforce within the region. And this will occur in a variety of ways. They'll provide scholarships, internship opportunities, workforce development, we actually have a great outstanding educational institution with the University of Guam that's already producing PhDs and graduate students who are currently assisting with the buildup. And I believe with further investment into the local community, we can provide even more. So by developing these resources on the island of Guam, we're gonna eliminate the need to import talent from abroad. This will ultimately decrease the financial cost of the government by removing unnecessary costs such as travel, travel expenses, per diem costs, all the unrelated, unnecessary overhead expenses of managing business off the island. Ultimately, we'll be able to provide a cost-effective product and service for the U.S. government. So everyone's aware of some of the competitive advantage of, of small businesses, of ADA small businesses. They can, um, they can sole source contracts directly with the government. They can compete on contracts specifically set aside for the ADA businesses. They can essentially become longer-term partners for the government. But the SBA program also provides various business trainings, mentoring and technical assistance, which really helps form a framework for them to become longer lasting, more professional businesses. And in fact, Native Alaskans and Native Hawaiian organizations have some additional benefits. They have sole sourcing amounts of up to $100 million with DOD projects, and they have a little bit more flexibility towards managing their ownership and affiliation rules, which really helps them grow. The Native Chamorro people of Guam and the Marianas could utilize similar benefits to grow into longer, long-term lasting partners for the federal government as well. So in conclusion, I believe that we have the talent and passion here in Guam and the Marianas Islands to contribute to the buildup. And through this bill, Chamorros can create better lives for themselves, for their families, and for the community as a whole. And I think it would be fitting that the federal spending that's coming into the islands be used to help the Native people of Guam and the Marianas. And just like our Native brothers and sisters of Hawaii and Alaska, we are loyal, dedicated, and capable Americans striving towards our daily American dreams. We just need that opportunity to make that dream a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Salas. Um, let me now uh, ask, uh, let me now call on Mr. Duval. Um, sir, uh, you have five minutes, please. Thank you. Chairman Grijalva, Vice Chairman Sablan, 
Ranking Member Westerman and members of the committee. I would first like to express my appreciation for the opportunity to appear today to provide testimony on HR 6504 and to provide an overview of Small Business Federal Procurement and SBA's socioeconomic programs. My name is Joshua Duvall and I'm a shareholder in the Washington DC office of Maynard Cooper and Gale, a member of the firm's Government Solutions Practice Group. I advise both large and small civilian and defense contractors in navigating the complex world of doing business with the federal government, including regularly advising small businesses with issues related to SBA socioeconomic contracting programs. I'm testifying today on my own behalf as a citizen and as an attorney with relevant knowledge of the subject matter. I'm not here to advocate for any policy outcome. My testimony today represents my own views and not the views of Maynard Cooper and Gale or any of its clients or of any organization in which I maintain membership. The SBA 8A program is a nine year program designed to help small businesses that are owned and controlled by socially and economically disadvantaged small businesses. The basic requirements to participate in the program generally are that it must be a small business which is unconditionally owned and controlled by one or more socially and economically disadvantaged individuals. And for, the, and for other reasons, including for Alaska Native corporations, Indian tribes, and Native Hawaiian organizations. These are different from individually owned 8A small businesses. On the other hand, the Hub Zone program seeks to promote economic development in economically distressed areas known as historically underutilized business zones. So the governing statute provides for definitions of what constitutes a Hub Zone, and that's because it's a place-based program. To qualify as a hub zone small business, the concerns principal office must be located in a hub zone and not fewer than 35% of the concerns employees must reside in a hub zone. And there are various other requirements for uh, entry into the hub zone program, including for Alaska Native corporations, Indian tribes, Native Hawaiian organizations. And notably, both Guam and the Northern Mariana Islands are designated as qualified non-metropolitan counties on SBA's hub zone map. As it relates to small business contracting, HR 6504 seeks to introduce new language into Title 15 of the United States Code, specifically in Section 632, to define uh, Native Shamaru and Native Northern Marianas organizations in Section 637A4 in the 8A program to place those organizations as socially and economically disadvantaged small business concerns, and in Section 657A, Paragraph B2, to place those concerns as hub zone small business concerns. In other words, 60, HR 6504 seeks to allow these nonprofit Native Shamaru organizations and Native Northern Marianas organizations to be designated as socially and economically disadvantaged small business concerns, which is different from a for profit organization uh, owned by 51% socially and economically disadvantaged individual. Further, HR 6504 seeks to allow both Native Shamaru organizations and Native Northern Marianas organizations to qualify as hub zone small business concerns, which would be different from a for profit hub zone concern. And notably, because of how Native Shamaru organizations and Native Northern Marianas organizations are defined under HR 6504, in each case, their respective business activities, by definition, must principally benefit the native Shamarus or persons of Northern Marianas descent. Again, I would like to thank the committee for inviting me to testify alongside these distinguished panelists today. And thank you, and I look forward to any questions that you may have. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Duval. I'm sure you very much would like to know that it's pronounced Chamorro, not Chamorro. Just a minor there, but uh, appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now um, I will turn to Mr. Schoonover. Uh, sir, you have five minutes, please. Thank you. Chairman Grijalva, Vice Chair Sablan, Ranking Member Westerman, and esteemed members of the committee. It's my privilege to join you today to discuss H.R. 6504, the Native Pacific Islanders of America Equity Act. But first, I'd like to tell you a little about myself. I am the managing member of Schoonover and Moriarty, LLC in Olathe, Kansas-based law firm that serves small business federal government contractors. We work with our clients on a broad range of issues relating to their work with the federal government. 
from complying with the myriad of laws, regulations, and contractual provisions covering their work with the government to complying with the U.S. Small Business Administration's Small Business and Socioeconomic Program regulations and representing them in performance disputes and bid protests with the government. My clients provide vital services and products that keep our government functioning. And as I mentioned, they're almost exclusively small businesses. One of the best parts of my practice is that I see firsthand the benefits that small business federal contracting dollars generate. These businesses provide quality, stable jobs to employees and oftentimes enable their, their employees to remain involved in their communities. Without exception, each takes pride in the work they perform on behalf of the government. Some of my clients are members of SBA's 8A business development program. Still others are hub zone small businesses. And though today's hearing involves these socioeconomic designations, I wish to make clear that my testimony today is mine alone. I'm not here to advocate on behalf of any client or other organization, nor am I here to advocate for or against any particular position relating to HR 6504. Rather, I wish to simply explain the importance of these socioeconomic programs as context for your deliberations. SBA's 8A Business Development Program is, in many respects, the granddaddy of the socioeconomic programs. Participation is limited to businesses that are at least 51% owned and controlled by individuals that have been subjected to social and economic disadvantage to right wrongs that hampered their, the ability of certain individuals or groups to fully participate in the American economy. SBA generally presumes that individuals belonging to certain ethnic groups have been subjected to such disadvantage. This includes Black Americans, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, including Alaskan Natives and Hawaiian Natives, and Asian Pacific Americans, including persons with origins from Guam or the Northern Mariana Islands, among others. Even if a member is not one of these presumed disadvantaged groups, an individual still may be able to establish social disadvantage through another characteristic or trait. Admission to the 8A program is not easy or fast. Establishing eligibility requires that a business provide an SBA to scrutinize a trove of business and personal records. And considering that SBA receives about 3,000 applications to the 8A program annually, it can take months to get in. Once admitted to the 8A program, though, the benefits for a small business can be significant. In fiscal year 2020, 8A participants, bolstered by unique contracting preferences and the increased ability to be awarded non-competitive contracts, earned nearly $59 billion in contract awards from the federal government, far outpacing any other socioeconomic designation. Unfortunately, historically underutilized business zones or hub zone companies were at the other end of the contracting spectrum. The fewer, they earned fewer contracts by dollar value than any other socioeconomic program, and federal agencies continue to fall short of their congressionally mandated 3% contracting goal. In 2020, hub zone businesses earned only about $13.6 billion in federal contracts. Personally, I view the federal government's continuing failure to meet its hub zone, the hub zone contracting goals as indefensible. The point of the program focuses on lifting underutilized communities through the influx of targeted dollars, and the importance of this money cannot be overstated. Importantly, under a hub zone's latest maps, both Guam and the Northern Marianas Islands fall within a hub zone. Given this status, the immediate impact of HR 6504 seems limited. But SBA's regulations can always be amended to remove this presumption, or its maps may change in a, in a way that eliminates the island's hub zone designations. The primary impact of the legislation thus, it seems to me, is to enshrine this status with federal law, thus making it more likely for these organizations, even as nonprofits, to continue to qualify for 8A program eligibility and hub zone status in the future. Moreover, this statutory enshrinement may make it possible for SBA to view Native Chamorro organizations and Northern Native uh, Marianas organizations on par with Alaskan Native organizations or Native Hawaiian organizations. This latter impact may take further legislation, but it's not without possibility.
Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. With this background, I'm happy to answer any questions that the committee may have about small business federal government contracting. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schimover, for that. Um, we appreciate all the witnesses' testimony. Uh, next, we will go to questions. Uh, committee Rule 3D imposes a five minute limit on questions. Uh, and the chair will recognize members on um, dating alternating uh, method uh, so that they may if they wish to ask questions. And I will play my five minutes and ask my questions. Um, I have questions for Governor Guerrero. Um, Madam Governor, you state that you're supportive of the intentions of the bill, but you would like funding appropriated to provide your administration the resources, the necessary resources to establish and maintain HMO registry for Guam. So can you hope or can I recommend an appropriate funding level you thinking would be adequate to create the registry and how much would be needed annually to maintain it? Thank you very much, uh, Congressman, for that uh, question. I have not worked out the details, but I was thinking between one, 1. 1.5 to $2 million to establish it and to maintain it. All right, and you also um, um, asked that regulations and guidance be included to properly establish uh, how your office will provide necessary information to SBA to determine native Chamorro organizations. So, could you elaborate on that? Do you yes. think that the of native Chamorro organizations for one provided in the bill is unclear? How will regulations help your administration's effort in this regard? You know, it would help in the sense that it would be clear on how we establish the processes and the procedures. A lot of time there are mandates and laws, and then when we go to implement it, it's confusing on how the process or how the interaction or how the relationship would be. And I think if we had some rules and regulations, it would just guide us along to be a lot clearer and to make it much more efficient and to make, make it a much more successful program. So that's basically why I was suggesting that to get some guidance from the federal government as to uh, how maybe our process and our procedures and our protocols could be established. And thank you, thank you, uh, Governor. Uh, sometimes uh, I'm also baffled by how we pass legislation and then the executive and interpreting those legislations come up with an entirely different interpretation of the intent of the legislation. Uh, thank you, Governor. Um, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, under the 1978 amendments, the Small Business Administration can subcontract under Section 8A with, and I quote, socially and economically disadvantaged small business concerns or businesses that are at least 51% owned by one or more socially and economically disadvantaged of individuals, end quote. So given that the current SBA regulations define economically dis disadvantaged individuals as Asian Pacific Americans from Guam and the Northern Marianas, why do you believe HR 6504 is necessary? Uh, and maybe Mr. Schoonover sort of alluded to some of these uh, concerns, but in your own thoughts, please. Well, um, thank you, uh, Congressman Sablan. I believe that the, um, this would expand the program. So in addition to those who are eligible under the current program as minority owned businesses, uh, they would, um, they would qualify as uh, a different category, similar to Super 8A businesses, and that would extend that they would not no longer be limited by an, a nine year time frame, which some of the businesses have already uh, come up to. And um, it would also expand, I think, the training and technical assistance to Guam, and it would uh, also, you know, require them this partnership with the nonprofits that would really uh, more importantly, bring the benefits to the entire community of Native Chamorros. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I, I have no other questions at this time, so I, I now like to yield. Uh, um, Mr. Benz, uh, first, let me thank you for stepping in and, and uh, I, I understand uh, uh, Jennifer Gonzalez-Colon has some flight 
issues, so she wasn't able to join us, but um, I'd like to recognize you, sir, for your five minutes of questioning. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. And yes, I understand that uh, my colleagues is uh, in an airplane uh, someplace. Uh, so I'm very, very happy though to to uh, join everyone today with, with this most interesting hearing. Uh, and I'm my questions uh, probably should be directed to Mr. Schoonover because uh, they have to do with the technical aspects of the program. And uh, I just would like to know if the um, extension of the eligibility uh, as suggested in subsection C uh, to a small business concern is uh, is this uh, is this different than what you, I think you tried to draw a link perhaps to uh, to Hawaii and uh, uh, maybe Alaska I'm not sure which but is this an extension a new extension of the program or simply one designed to bring uh, these folks current uh, up to where other folks already are. Well, and and thank you for the the question. I, I think that that the modification would probably be to enshrine the current abilities in federal law. Now, I think perhaps the question is, would this definition put a uh, native? Chamaro, and I'm I'm sorry for mispronouncing that. I I I mean no offense. Um, and Native Northern Marianas organizations on par with Native Alaskan organizations and Native Hawaiian organizations. I don't necessarily believe this in and of itself would do that. That might require further um, uh, legislation or certainly further uh, further regulatory action by SBA. Uh, the yeah, I think it, the, the regulations already established a rebuttal presumption. Individual from Guam and the Commonwealth of Marianas are socially disadvantaged. Uh, can you tell me if this legislation changes this or if the practical federal, uh, effect of the legislation should it pass uh, be the same as it currently stands? I, I guess what I'm getting at, what are the practical implications of codifying something like like this regulation in statute? I, I mean, it, I kind of wonder why we're we're basically saying, well, it's okay the way it is now, but we don't want it to change. Therefore, we're going to put it into law. What, what do you think of that technique? Uh, well, I think certainly the codifying it, uh, codifying um, the definition of of uh, small business concerns or, or socially and economically disadvantaged concerns when we talk about the 8A program, um, would certainly bolster that presumption that already exists and make it more difficult if that presumption ever were to change uh, regu reg regulatorily, excuse me, um, would make that more difficult to do. Um, certainly if, if federal law exists that defines um, socially and economically disadvantaged uh, uh, groups to include uh, uh, individuals with origins in, in either group, then it would be harder to change that regulatorily later. Yes, it would be. Uh, the, the other thing that's a bit odd to me is the means of establishing or the definition that establishes Native Shamaru, um, uh, which just goes back to a date, August 1st, 1950, with no regard to residency or uh, or, or uh, what uh, blood, blood quantum. Uh, so that seems to be, uh, Make it difficult to, to argue that that there aren't other folks other than Shamaro involved in this. Does that does that matter? Because as I understand it, I quickly researched this. Thirty seven point three percent of the population are Shamaru and the rest are not. But perhaps many are there from uh, have an ancestor that was there before 1950. Does it matter that uh, folks aren't um, uh, of that particular ancestry? Uh, well, I think it would it would matter if if they were claiming ancestry um, or an organ or as part of a group that they are actually not a part of. Certainly, that would be problematic under um, SBA's contracting programs. And and as the 8A um, regulations currently exist, Congressman, those regulations say that even if a member is, or excuse me, if an individual is part of one of these groups that the, the SBA presumes to be disadvantaged, that person still must hold themselves out 
um, as a member of, of the group. And in some cases, SBA may look into that before they admit um, a, a company to the 8A program. Right. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And I'm out of time. I yield back. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Mr. Benz. So um, now let me recognize the bill's author, um, Mr. Stanislaus, for his five minutes of questioning. Mike, please. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the witnesses for their testimony here today. I did want to provide some clarity before I posited some questions that would help to, I, I hope, uh, uh, further uh, provide clarity. Uh, the legislation goes so far as to identify who would, in fact, be um, qualified to consider themselves as native for the purposes of the 8A program. And it sets a period certain in doing that. It's the um, 1950 date that's in the legislation, which is the date that um, citizenship was conveyed on the um, on the inhabitants of Guam over the passage of the Organic Act. And so by virtue of us defining that period and those who can trace their ancestry prior to that period, those would in effect be what we are qualifying in the legislation as native for the purposes of the um, applicability of the native interpretations under the 8A program under the SBA. Um, and I wanted to, I could provide clarity, but I wanted to afford um, my governor my speaker the opportunity uh, to speak to the significance of why why are we using 1950 as the date particularly with respect to our recent um court entanglements with our tomorrow land trust and how we're trying to navigate not having the complications associated with blood quantum that our native um, brothers and sisters in hawaii actually had to suffer from i'll go ahead and yield first to uh, governor leon guerrero Thank you very much, uh, Congressman. Yes, definitely. Um, the, the time period has been identified as definition for some kind of reference of how we um, define and how we make uh, Native uh, Chamorros uh, eligible. I also wanted to say that in the discussions and the judicial debates over this recent um, case, with uh, Davis on the issue of uh, Native Chamorros, um, there was a concern about unconstitutionally and discriminatory. And uh, the argument from the other side was it was racially um, influenced. Uh, but we argued that because Congress actually was the one that also defined Native Chamorros with that period of time. And so we argued it was more for social justice and the issue of racial or blood lineage and so forth was then not the case. And uh, as you said, uh, Congressman, it dates back to include those people. And there are going to be some people that are not really racially tomorrow that would meet that definition. So I don't know how that plays into the SBA, but I think the way it's defined is defined in alignment with Congress's definition. Madam Speaker, I'll go ahead and yield to you. Thank you very much, Congressman St. Nicholas, and thank you for your efforts on this bill. Uh, yeah, this is a complex issue for Guam as well, because uh, our efforts to define Native Chamorros over many years uh, in, in, with Congress uh, have uh, really been um, challenging, to say the least. Uh, and as the Congressman alluded to recently, there's been court cases where our, our use of the word Native Chamorro or Chamorro even have been challenged in court. And so we are trying to find a way, I would think, to, to not have any impediment put in front of these native Chamorros to actually avail of the program and that this would allow them to provide the documentation required in the bill we can provide documentation back to 1950 going back further or with any other um, descriptions uh, might prove problematic and might delay the ability of these native companies to avail of this program and again delay the benefits to the native Chamorros uh, community at large. But um, yeah, so, you know, just it's our experience of legal challenges and I'm, um, but we believe that for purposes of this bill, this would identify uh, 
those businesses that should be qualified should be eligible and meeting all the other criteria, of course. And uh, and it would be one of the fastest ways to to identify them. And with the registry being conducted by the governor's office and audited according to the bill, I believe that it, it would be a safe way to do that. Thank you. And, and so to summarize real quick, Mr. Chairman, we're trying to, to, to walk that, that narrow path of being able to make sure that we are able to identify our native people properly, but also within the context of what is acceptable um, in our judicial system within the United States. Uh, we, we don't want to actually walk into the morass of having to um, uh, go fight for um, recognition on a blood quantum basis or, or on, an, on, a, on a heritage slash ancestry basis. We're willing to accept what is actually being um, uh, described as an acceptable basis by our own federal courts, which is a period certain uh, in 1950, and our local government that is led by local tomorrows are also willing to accept that date for the purposes of the legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize for going over. No, no, thank you for that. And in the Northern Marianas, there is a definition of Northern Marianas descent, and it started over a decade ago in the beginning of four elections on, on land alienation issues also, but um, I, I ref as an election official, I refused to do that registration eventually. However, it's uh, now being done and it's being used for purposes other than elections officials, which would be uh, uh, something that violates the Ayatano uh, court decision. So thank you very much, Chairman San Nicolas. Um, let me now recognize Mr. Moore, sir. Uh, welcome, you have five minutes. Thank you, Chairman, Representative Bentz. Appreciate you covering and stepping in. Um, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump right into questions uh, to, all the, to all the witnesses. Thanks for being here. Mr. Duvall, in your testimony, you point out the, the, you point out the long list of groups that fall into the, the socially disadvantaged definition. From a strictly administrative perspective, is this a good way to, to structure a program? Joshua, thank you. yeah. Yep. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Thank you, Congressman. Um, it is different than the current, the way the current regulation is set out because the proposed piece of legislation seeks to introduce the uh, organizations as socially and economically disadvantaged small businesses by statute. And that is different than an individual that can meet the social and economic disadvantage requirements and on their own, and which uh, my distinguished panelist, Mr. Schoonover mentioned earlier, can be a, a long and uh, perhaps challenging process to ensure that the SBA does in fact trace a social and economic disadvantage. I mean, could, could you serve it, to try to add some context to that, could you serve it, serve disadvantaged groups better by maybe simplifying the eligibility pot for the program? And uh, are we running the risk of perpetually expanding it? I don't have an answer for that. I'm not quite sure. Um, SBA's programs are, as I put in my written testimony, uh, put in a way to ensure that the proper folks who are uh, applying for these programs, the money that's being funded is going to those individuals, whether they be a hub zone qualified entity, a service disabled veteran owned small business entity, an 8A entity, or a woman owned small business entity. Um, would you, would you, uh expound on anything with related to the uh, the SBA's 8A business development program you know just speaking as a as an informed private citizen can you share any structural changes that you would want implemented with that with that program um, off the top of my head I'm, I'm not, unfortunately not prepared to answer that I think it, the way that the program is designed now is to ensure that the folks that are uh, indeed socially and economically disadvantaged are um, uh, granted access into that program, yeah. uh, thereby being able to derive the benefits that flow from it. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Mr. Skinover, uh, while we're reaching outside the scope of this committee's director's jurisdiction, can you, can you talk to us about waste, fraud, abuse, anything in the 8A program? 
Um, heard stories of companies structuring or restructuring themselves to meet the program's requirements. Kind of, is this type of activity common? Um, uh, let, let me start there. Thank you, Congressman Moore. And and uh, whether activity is is common, I, I guess I can't anecdotally say. I've certainly heard instances, and I believe um, SBA and the Department of Justice, for that matter, publicize um decisions where or or issues where um people uh have have tried to skirt their rules and certainly under the 8a program there are a lot of rules for businesses to comply with and um it, waste fraud and abuse continues to be an issue um in federal government contracting certainly when we talk about the the billions upon billions of dollars at issue it, you know it, it it tends to be uh, a problem. That said, I believe that SBA, as part of the 8A program in particular, when a business goes through um, the application process, I mentioned in my, my testimony the trove of documents that they have to provide, um, and they have to continue to provide documents and information to SBA throughout their participation in the program to make sure that only eligible businesses uh, can participate. Would that be maybe one of the biggest, um, you know, improvements that you would like to see take place? Uh, is there anything else with respect to that question of just, you know, if you had your magic wand, what would you want to see implemented to, to improve this? So we're focusing on like efficient operations. No one's sure. arguing the merit of this, but making sure that we're focusing on efficient operations instead of just manipulating it for any federal procurement opportunities. Any just big picture changes we need to make, improvements? I tend to think, uh, Congressman, that SBA is overworked and understaffed, um, as, as are a lot of agencies, I think. SBA has a lot on their plate, and there are a lot of rules and regulations for businesses to comply with, and I'm sorry for time. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Chairman. That, and I, uh, I don't know. I've read the bill, and I find it far from being manipulative in one way. Um, but thank you very much. Uh, I understand this. Mr. Case is, uh, Congressman Case, a strong supporter uh, for the insular areas. Um, are you on that? All right, we'll move on to uh, Mr. Chue Garcia, the member of Congress who has the same name as my late father. Please, you have five minutes. So. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and it's a uh, wonderful name and a fun name as well. Uh, our country's relationship with Guam, with the Northern Mariana Islands and other territories is a reminder of the legacy of colonialism. We're talking about centuries of widespread violence and cultural erasure, all while the Chamaru, uh, Chamo, Chamoru people capacity for social and economic mobility and growth. The native Pacific Islanders of America Equity Act is a small step towards rectifying these wrongs. It would mean affording the Chamoru people and their small businesses the opportunities that they would otherwise have in the mainland. Aside from allowing small businesses to access much needed small business administration programs, how else would the Chamoru people benefit from a Chamoru registry program and that question I would direct to Governor Guerrero. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Garcia. I, I, I too like your name, Jesus, as my father's name is Jesus, but we call him Chu, not Chewy. So um, we have something in common. Um, how else this would be used, I feel, would be in our pursuit and in our plebiscite uh, campaign for self-determination. Um, this would actually give us an opportunity to uh, move forward quicker. Um, and if we stood up a, a, a Native Chamorro registry, which we are, we are trying to do that through uh, the Election Commission, and it's done uh, by local statute. But we also, I feel, this federal um, codifying it in our organic act and through this federal legislation would only give it much more strength and much more acknowledgement and recognition 
for our pursuit for our self-determination in deciding our political status. And you're absolutely correct, and I agree with your comments. Thank you. And in your testimony, Governor, you mentioned uh, that your administration is prepared to carry out the provisions of this bill requiring the establishment of a genealogy database. Can you elaborate on this and what steps you'll take to establish this database? Yes, we would probably set up, um, Mr. Uh, Representative Garcia, we would probably set up, uh, sorry, um, stand up a separate uh, office for it. We would have to staff it. We would have to bring in some uh, technology to make sure that we are uh, registering people um, accurately and as fast as we can. So we would need to uh, provide staffing, administrative support, and also technological support for this uh, Chamorro registry to be fully implemented and to really do what its purpose is for. Thank you. And a question uh, for Mr. Robert Salas II. Uh, Can you talk about the impact that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on your business and what resources were made available and how would access to SBA programs have helped out if they had been in place? So, um, yeah, COVID-19 has been difficult, I think, in Guam for, in general. Uh, the tourism, you know, one of our biggest industries, tourism. Luckily, I'm in the contracting industry, so we were considered an essential business and still able to continue to work. But that being said, we have to be very, we have to take a lot of precautions, which means that if someone is, if someone's testing positive or they're tracing near someone that is positive, our entire job site gets shut down. I've literally had 20 to 30 people that have had to be out of work and slowed down my, um, and put my jobs on a stop until I had clarity of they were positive or not. So it has a huge impact, has a very huge impact on our ability to perform work as well as the morale for the people there. And, you know, you can try your best, you can try to isolate, but it's difficult, it's really difficult. Um, luckily, we were able, able to get some loans. We had to keep, we were able to take advantage of the PPP loan. So we were able to utilize that and um, help ensure that we got all the tracings done. We, we paid for every testing, we paid for all the testing for, for our staff. We got as much PPE as possible to make sure that everyone's as safe as possible. The, the health and welfare of our people is the most important thing. Um, so that being said, the SBA development program, I think, I'm not sure if there's a correlation necessarily between COVID-19 and, and that program's availability, but what I can say is though that um, being a part of that program will help us get more development tools and hopefully we'll be able to get better financial understandings and things like that, things of that nature to help get Great. proper um, loans and financing to help um, get proper PPE yep. and things better take care of our people. Thank you for that. And just uh, to close, uh, if you could just in the two or three uh, sentences say how uh, this bill would help you as a small business owner. And after that, I will yield Mr. Uh, Chairman. Okay, so in two sentences, uh, it would help us by giving us the opportunity to compete on set aside programs and giving the Chamorro people an opportunity to, to compete on these programs and learn and grow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, and hey, um, now I see that uh, our colleague from Puerto Rico is safely uh, on, on from her flight. So, uh, Jennifer, uh, I'd like to recognize you for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to say thank you uh, for holding this hearing and, and to Ranking Member Benz to, for stepping up. Thank you. I was in a four hour delay flight from DCA to Puerto Rico, so you may imagine uh, how sad I am that I'm, I'm, I'm late, but I'm here. And I read the testimonies, and I want to say thank you for all, to all the witnesses that are here, and of course, my colleague, uh, San Nicolas, uh, for his, his bill as well. Good to see you again, Governor. Um, I, I do have questions, and, 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 and uh, I want to begin with one of those, um, in, and this is to Mr. Schooner. Uh, Schoonover, I mean, if I'm, I'm not pronouncing uh, right, please correct me. Uh, you said in your testimony uh, that uh, the help zone uh, businesses earn fewer contracts by dollar value than any other socio socioeconomic program, and that the federal government has failed to meet the, its help zone contracting goal of 3%. And I am 
particularly interested in, in this issue uh, because uh, given the uh, approximately 82% of the island of Puerto Rico, my district, uh, has a hub zone designation. And I believe all or ne nearly all of Guam and the Northern Mariana Islands uh, also fall within a hub zone. Um, my, my question will be, what actions specifically can be taken uh, to improve the Hobson program and facilitate the federal government's uh, goal of awarding at least 2% of the federal contracts dollars to Hobson certified companies? Thank you, Congresswoman. And I, I think it's a wonderful question. You know, my, the Hub Zone program is, if, if I had to choose a favorite, uh, it would be the hub zone program because, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats is how I view the hub zone program. And it's really unique among SBA's uh, socioeconomic programs. Um, and I think SBA is doing more uh, to, to make the program accessible, not only for companies, uh, but also for contracting officers and agency officials to have some assurance that the uh, that the companies that they are contracting with actually meet those eligibility requirements it can be very tough for hub zone companies to maintain their hub zone status especially when we talk about employees moving or or leaving a hub zone uh, leaving their employment with companies and i believe sba's most recent rulemaking on uh, the hub zone program should help address some of those. Now, it's still probably too soon to tell the overall impact, um, but I'm optimistic that it will. Thank you. And I, and I need to say that you submitted in your testimony many good um, uh, suggestions uh, that should be incorporated in the legislation. And I, I, I do support some of them, you know, having my district kind of with the same situation geographically of having 82% of the island being a hub zone and knowing that the provision is already there in the state, in, 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 the, in the law, uh, but we're not using it and we are not benefiting uh, for that. And the same situation happened uh, to the islands in the Pacific. Uh, so I, I fully understand that uh, although this is a small business issue and, and I know that the small business community may, may, may have uh, interaction with this kind of uh, legislation, I, I, I really believe that we should get their input uh, to see how we can manage and see this bill as an opportunity uh, to, to secure uh, th those benefits for the economic reasons of the islands. Um, my, my question now is going to be for the governor. Um, you said in your statement, that, and I was uh, reviewing this, uh, and, and, and again, I, I just want to um, say hello as well to the Speaker of the House of Guam. I was Speaker of the House of Puerto Rico, so I do respect the job you do. Uh, but, but Governor, you said that you may need additional funds to uh, create the register. How much money we're we talking about? Yes, I, I think I said to Congress um, Sablon about 1.5 to $2 million. A year. We don't have all the details yet, um, Congresswoman, but uh, initially when we are looking at technology, space, so that staffing. Will be, that will be the initial investment or you you may think this, this is going to be a, um, a budget that you may need annually. And, and I know we're talking about both. I would, right. I, I would, I would say it would be an annual budget. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I know my time expired. Right. Thank you. Um, look, um, I have no further questions. I'm not. Oh, I'm seeing now Miss Miss Porter is on. Uh, champion for the Marshall Islands. Uh, Katie, uh, if you wish, you have five minutes, please. No, uh, absolutely no need to ask a question. I just wanted to show my support for, for having this conversation and uh, thank you for your leadership on these issues. Right. And just before you yield back, I'm, I'm wondering if Mr. Sunny Claus has any further questions. You could yield him your time if he needs it. I would be happy to uh, be recognized and to yield to Mr. San Nicolas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Porter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, to be, to be clear, the legislation was not written with any appropriation 
uh, specifically for the purposes of us not getting mired in the um, the further challenges that come with with a attaching dollar signs to to legislation. As I'm sure my colleagues, uh, I see my 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 senior colleague um, Ms. Gonzalez Colon with a big smile on her face. When 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 there's dollar signs attached to legislation, the hurdles become very different. And so um, I wanted to ask. Um, uh, the speaker, perhaps, seeing how this could potentially be funded locally as opposed to requiring federal dollars, if in the event um, federal dollars would prove to be more prohibitive to the legislation moving forward, um, would the Guam legislature be willing to um, uh, find find resources to be able to fund this uh, with local appropriations so that we can have the statute in place federally but um, avoid the, the the hurdles that would come with trying to attach federal dollars to it. Uh, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Congressman Sir Nicholas. Uh, as you know, I can't speak uh, on, for future legislatures or on behalf of everyone at this time, but uh, I will work towards that. And I find it um, uh, my glance at the let well, my look at the legislation. Um, indicated to me that I, I believe this can be consistent with some of the programs that we have in place. It can, we have a Department of Chamorro Affairs, hopefully, that can uh, help to implement it. It's creating a list uh, with the help of the SBA and uh, auditor to audit the list. I, I believe um, I would I would make efforts to try to incorporate this in, in our existing, if that's going to result in getting the benefit to these businesses sooner rather than later, getting the benefits to the uh, community sooner rather than later. We also have a, a you know Department of Revenue and Taxation that uh, may be able to help. During the pandemic, our, our, our agencies have really been stretched. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I agree with the governor that any resources would be, um, you know, welcome to help to implement this. However, yeah, if it's going to cause a delay, I do not want to see a delay. I would rather that we uh, be able to accommodate this within our existing agencies uh, and 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 try to get the, um, the, the registry itself um, ready. And um, because of, uh, you know, the definition that you've used, I think we've, we've tried on different in different ways to make it very streamlined. And uh, so I'm hoping that that will result. Thank you, Congress. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And and uh, I would also like to pose the same to the governor. Um, I, governor, I have absolute respect for you seeking additional federal resources to implement this. I think that it would naturally be absolutely the um, the, the thing to ask for. Uh, but again, just 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 facing the um, the potential hurdles of the legislation coming coming to full uh, Full enactment. Um, if if dollars, if, if federal dollars become the hurdle, um, would uh, would your administration also be open to on a budgetary basis or on a transfer authority basis, um, trying to find local resources to, to to help get this thing off the ground? Thank you very much, Congressman. Of course, I would not be doing my job for the people of Guam if I didn't come to advocate for more federal resources to our island. And this is why I had put uh, made the recommendation. But um, I also wanted to say that, um, Mr. Chair and members of this committee, in order for this program to be successful, it has to have its own um, own staff own resources. We've tried it through the Guam Election Commission. And as you know, agencies who have multitask and multi um, functions, it gets lost and it doesn't have the required attention to make it successful. And this is a very important program, I feel, because it opens up to a lot of other things, like I said, with the issue of self-determination and political status plebiscite. So um, I would have to uh, send down a bill to uh, the legislature to make those appropriations as are the authority for making those appropriations. And my transfer authority is only 250,000. So it's not really uh, sufficient and adequate to stand up a very, uh, uh, very successful, very uh, clear and very uh, purposeful um, program. Well, so to summarize, Mr. Chairman, um, I think that locally my legislature will be willing to do the work. My governor is absolutely committed to making it work out properly. Um, if my colleagues will support federal funding and we can smoothly move this, absolutely. 
but in the absence of that, um, I would I would like to defer to us just getting this thing through and, and making the progress that it's uh, represented in the existing language. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I uh, I don't see any other member uh, needing time for additional questions, um, but uh, just as an information that this bill also is the subject has been assigned to the Small Business Administration. That is also um, another hurdle that uh, this committee, um, Mr. San Nicolas' office and our office would have to face and, and try to move it forward. But uh, um, I want to thank uh, all our witnesses today for their valuable testimony and uh, the members for their questions. The uh, so housekeeping item, the members of the committee may have some additional questions for the witnesses and we will ask you to please respond to those in writing um, under committee rule 3 all members of the committee must submit witness questions questions within three business days following the hearing and the hearing record will be held open for 10 business days for the responsibilities again thank you to our witnesses and the members for being in today's hearing uh seeing that there's no further business so without objection the committee stands adjourned